2 Kings chapter 6, the Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight. That word straight means small. It means small. Somebody say small. It's too small for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. Somebody say, You got your marching orders. Go. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was filling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And the iron head did swim. Do you understand what just happened? Man was cutting down a tree. And somewhere in cutting down the tree, the axe head dislodged from the handle. The axe head fell in the water and sank to the bottom. That's what has happened to some of you all. You, you've, been, you've been fighting something all year. And you lost your head. And it was sinking. But the last sermon I'm going to give you on this watch, on this last Sunday of this year, I need you to help me preach it. I need you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know what you have gone through, but the pastor wants you to know that no matter what you do, keep your head up. That, that's what we want to talk about today. Just slap three people before you sit down and tell them, keep your head up. Keep your head up. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you got a little Tupac saint gangster in you, I know you. Don't cry, dry your eye. Never let up. I knew you were some Christian gangsters in here this morning. My definition of a miracle may differ than yours. My definition of a miracle is simply this, when God customizes a situation in spite of what's customary in your life. That, that's, that's all it is. It's, it's God tailor making a moment to make sure that you make it through. It, it's God looking at the specificity of your dilemma and customizing an answer for you. That's, that's what a miracle is. He, he, won't, he won't give you water if you have water. He, he won't give you the ability to stretch forth your hands if your hands are working. He will only stretch forth your hand if your hand is atrophied. And he will only give you a miracle in your legs if your legs are not working. He will not give you anything to waste. He will give you what you need because the miracle is when God looks at your particular circumstances and says, oh, you're out of wine. I'll take water and turn it into wine. I won't give you what you don't need. I'll give you exactly what you need from a source you could not get it from. Are you with me so far? A miracle supersedes the natural. It makes the far-fetched seem nearby. It, it's, it's, when God, it's when God really shatters rules and makes sure that people understand that he's a provider and it doesn't matter the circumstance, he will do anything for a friend. <laughs> Anybody glad that you're a friend of God? See... When you are his friend, he will travel for four days and come into a tomb where you stink and still call you forward. When you are a friend of God, he will, he will step out in the middle of a raging storm so that you can walk to him on water. Because when you are a friend of God, there is no place you can be that God does not know. And I don't know about you. I'm just glad that I'm a friend of God and that he's a friend of mine. Somebody say, I'm, I'm a friend of God. However, it is one thing in life to witness miracles. And let me tell you, you would be blessed to witness one miracle in your lifetime. You would be blessed 
to witness one miracle in your lifetime. So you are blessed. Anybody ever seen a miracle? Anybody ever seen God provide a miracle? Uh, let me say it the way Grandma and them said it. Has he ever made a way? So I, I, knew, I knew what church you came from. <laughs> made a way out of no way. I, you're blessed to see one miracle. But can I tell you something? If you're blessed to see a miracle, you are even more blessed when God uses you to perform them. Mm. I, I want to talk. Because see, see, in, 19, in 2019, you were, you were a recipient of miracles. But what you don't understand is God is about to shift this thing and he's about to work miracles through you. See, it's one level of favor when God allows you to witness the miracle. It's another level of favor when he uses your mouth to make a miracle. Oh, oh I'm, I'm about to help somebody here today. See, in 2019, you, you had to take your child to the doctor or you had to go to the hospital and you saw God perform a miracle. 2020, it's going to be like this. You're going to lay your hands on yourself. Oh, God. In, in, in 2019, he was giving you a raise. In 2020, he's going to give you the company. <laughs> I, I guess this ain't for everybody. It's just for a few of us. In, in, in 2020, you had to call up your prayer warriors. In 2020, they're going to call you. Why? Because God's about to flip it. The power is going to go from the outside to the inside. You're going to go from experiencing miracles to being a miracle worker. Now, that, that's, 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 it's, it's good news because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says uh, that, that Elisha is not only uh, the conduit of receiving miracles, but because he is now the protege of Elisha, the prophet, he is now, as the prophet has gone up in the fire uh, and the horses and the chariots, and he has now received a double portion of the spirit, he is now gone from witnessing miracles to causing miracles. His life has changed. And see, you got to understand that this is getting ready to happen for you. The season is going to shift. You are about to become the person you admired. <laughs> if I get 39 people to rock with me for the next 15 minutes, we'll be done. I don't need everybody because this isn't for any, this isn't for everybody. It's just for a few people who recognize that the season is getting ready to change. You, you've been watching Elijah. Now it's time for you to become Elisha. And you don't have to become the person you watched because once you get a double portion of the spirit, you don't become them, you become you. Yeah. Touch somebody, say, I'm about to be me. I'm about to be me. I'm about to be me. I, I'm, I'm about to be me. Elijah is now propagating and is the conduit by which God has leveraged his anatomy to perform miracles. You, you remember uh, there was uh, a captain of the army named Naaman uh, who, who had contracted a disease called leprosy. Leprosy was such a devastating disease that it would cause one to smell from a distance and the skin would rot and begin to eat itself up from the inside out. And the Bible says that because he was in the presence of the prophet named Elisha, Elisha spoken to him and said, I want you to do something. I want you to do something uncanny and unthinkable. I want you to take your dirty self and go wash in a dirty river. The name of the river is the Jordan River. And I don't just want you to wash in the river. I want you to wash in the river seven times. And because he listened to the prophet, he came back and the Bible says he was made whole. There was a Shunammite woman uh, who had allowed the prophet to come into his house, into the furnished room. And she was bearing and she was trying to give birth to children, but she could not. But because she let the prophet stay in her house, when she let the prophet come into a room, he spoke a baby into her womb. Y'all going to get this in a minute. That there was a woman who had a son that died and because the prophet showed up the prophet spoke into this woman's son and the Bible says that he came to life are you here with me because I just want you to before I finish it all if you don't do anything I want you to preach to your neighbor and tell him God's about to shift the season he's gonna shift the season he's gonna shift the season there was there was a woman I believe she was a widow and her husband had died and and her version of the IRS had come to her house to collect taxes and she did not have anything to pay it with. So the Bible lets us know that they were getting ready to take her son into slavery as collateral because she did not have the oil to pay. Watch this because her husband is dead and she did not have a job and her husband was the provider and now she's down to her last little bit of oil. But the prophet said, 
go to all of your neighbors and borrow vessels. And the Bible says that she went to all of these houses and she borrowed vessels. And guess what? Every vessel she borrowed, God filled it. If she would have borrowed more vessels, God would have filled more vessels. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God told me to tell you, whatever you got the faith to ask for, he's going to fill it. This is the same prophet. This is the same prophet who saw God take poisonous stems and turn them into pure stems. And watch God, saw, watch this, God multiplied food in a famine. And then God told him to tell the people that while they were in Moab, that he was going to give them water without rain. Do you understand the kind of power that is in your mouth when you are a conduit of God, that God can use your mouth to give water without rain? That's a miracle. God says, I'm going to make it come up even when it ain't coming down. I wish I had somebody in this place who understood that over the next 365 days, miracles are getting ready to come out of your mouth. If I had anybody who believed it, I would have to stop this sermon right now and give you 30 seconds to recover. Because everything you call, God's going to make it happen. I'm going to wait on you to catch up. That means you can walk to the job. And tell the boss without telling the boss, I command you to give me a raise. I command my child to be healed. I command these lumps to come out of my body. I command this blood pressure to come down. I command this diabetes to regulate itself. I dare somebody, I command lupus to leave this body. I command health to enter into my soul. Somebody shout, I command it. Because you're getting ready to go from experiencing miracles to causing miracles. Now, don't be surprised if you get new friends. Don't, don't, don't be surprised if everybody who got your last name is now all of a sudden miraculously related to you. Don't, don't be surprised if people want to reconcile because they're going to see that everything you touch, everywhere you tread, everywhere you go, goodness and mercy is fine. Is anybody in the back believe it too? I, I don't care what time you showed up to church. How many of you know that even if you're late, God is on time? I decree and declare that 2020 is a year of miracles. Somebody shout miracles, signs, and wonders. Come on, rewind that, press play. Miracles miracles, signs, and wonders. Matter of fact, look at your neighbor and say, I decree and declare miracles, signs, and wonders. Are you going to be glad you came to church today? Somebody shout, I'm a miracle worker. I'm a miracle worker. Now, I understand that the seven miracles that we have just perused in the text are once notable of our scrutiny. But this next miracle, I do not understand how it makes the pages of the pericope. I am confused because if a miracle is to be performed, I understand performing a miracle for a widow woman who needs to feed her child. And I understand if there is a woman who lives in a culture where birth is her rite of passage and God allows the prophet to call forth the baby and I understand why God would raise a little boy up out of death because it would help the community and the family to improve their faith but I don't understand why God would allow a miracle worker to be fooling with an axe head you can take it to Ace Hardware in Jerusalem and they can put a little glue around the stick and stick the axe head on. You don't need a miracle for an axe head. Unless the axe head is a picture. Un unless it is a shadow. Unless it is something pointing to something greater. Why waste a miracle on wood and iron? It's a picture of the cross. Because remember, the cross was wooden. But the nails... <laughs> The nails were iron. That's, that's, that's where we are. It's really a picture. It's an allegory because I told you a thousand times and I'll say it a thousand more that the Old Testament is God concealed. The New Testament 
is God revealed. And so now we have yet another shadow of proving to us that our faith has validity. It is just an axe head. But what we really see is God doing something bigger because now they are at the school of the prophets. And there was a young, a young man coming up through the ranks. He is a professor. His name is Elijah. And he is at the school of the prophets teaching these young boys how to prophesy. This was the same school that Samuel and Eli went to and, and they were able to choose Saul and David as the king. They are at the school of the sons of the prophets and all of a sudden in this school, in this room where they had been learning about the ways of God and learning how to express prophecy in a way that is palatable to those of us who are in the faith. All of a sudden, in this room where they learned and where they prayed and where they fasted and where, where they were able to receive the Holy Writ, all of a sudden, one of them stood up and said, this room is too small. This room is too small. This, this check is too small. This, this job is too small. This house is too small. This business is too small. This influence is too small. They, they all of a sudden got, got to the place in their life where they got tired of being small. I, I don't even know how y'all picked a song today called It's Gonna Be Big. It looks like God is getting ready to blow somebody's mind. They, they all of a sudden, they just looked around and said, it's, just, it's too small. It's too small. Can I just help you understand something? It ain't going to get bigger until you decide it's too small. I, I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but some of y'all sitting back talking about, God, I need you to make 2020 big. God said, I ain't going to make it big until you decided that 2019 was too small. I dare anybody in here right now to let the devil know I will no longer settle for small things. Now, I understand the Bible says despise not small beginnings, but after you get over despising, it's time to accelerate. I wish I had somebody in here. He doesn't say that you have to dwell in small things. He says that you don't despise them. And once you recognize that it's okay for it to be small, now it's time for it to be big. Slap three people on the hand and say it's going to be a big year. It's going to be a big year. Everything you thought about 2020 was already too small. Everything that you prayed about for 2020 was already too small. Everything you dreamed about for 2020 was too small. I came to declare and decree it's going to be big. Now, I don't need everybody. I just need a few hundred people in here right now to give a big future, a big praise. I dare you to shout right now like it's going. Now, I want you to see something. I'm getting ready to give you the first thing that's going to help you keep your head up. Are you ready? <clears throat> Here's what the Bible says. And they said, this is too small for us. So they went down. There you are, pastor. They went down and they cut down trees. Okay, you missed it. And they said, this is too small for us. And they went down and they cut down beams. See, in order for you to make it in 2020, the first thing you're going to need is consensus. Some of y'all are not going to be able to build because half of your circle is saying it's too big and half of your circle is satisfied with status quo. You got to get everybody out of your circle who ain't saying us. You, you can't have half the people excited about the size of it and another half talking about it has to be big. The problem is, is that a double-minded circle, a double-minded squad, a, a double-minded set of friends is unstable in all of his ways. How many of y'all got just that one negative person in your circle that no matter where you go, they always complain and they always late. The food ain't never good. The temperature of the chicken ain't never hot enough. The steak ain't never right. They send everything back. They take half the drink and drink half of it and then say they don't like it and then send it back. Oh, it's watered down. Oh, it's too strong. Shut up! <laughs> Who am I talking to in this place today? You're going to need consensus in your circle. As a matter of fact, I want you to look down your row and say, neighbor, for the next 20 minutes, I need consensus on this row. I'm going to be praising God all along. And, and if you can't, there's a seat over there. You can go have consensus by yourself. But as for me and my row, we're going to praise the Lord. I dare you to make everybody on your row shout. Give them a stank face. Look at them. If you're not going to shout on this row, if you're not going to give God glory on this row, go find some other dead folks. But as for me and my row, there will be consensus. Why? Because when praises go up. Do 
a pew check. Do a pew check. Look at him. Tell him God's about to blow your mind. I decree and declare big things. I decree and declare larger territory. I decree and declare more than you can handle. Somebody shout it's going to be. You need a cooperative squad. You need people who down for the cause. You need people to say, I don't know who we fighting, but just let me know. Why are we fighting them? I, why am I stumping them? Why, why am I hitting them? Who are we about to go beat up? You need people who ask questions after you finish. Uh -huh, I know it's a little violent, but it's, you don't need to be because the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. You, you don't even need to sit next to people who wait on half the sermon to be done before they say hallelujah. You, you need to find a whole nother uh, a seat section and crew to sit next to in 2020. Matter of fact, I wouldn't even sit next to people who I sat next to this year and they didn't say nothing all year. Ain't chances they ain't going to say nothing next year. So you might as well find you somebody. cooperation that, that's really your problem is you don't have consensus in your circle the problem is is you're trying to do better and they ain't trying to do nothing the, the, the problem is is you're trying to move on with your life and they stuck in their position <laughs> The truth is, is that you already see it's time to move forward, but you're spending so much of your energy trying to drag them with you that you've slowed your progress because you're carrying dead weight. The problem is, is that I encourage you on Sunday, and then when you go call them to tell them what I said, they end up talking you out of your glory. And you too scared to break away because you think, oh, we've been together so long. We've been friends so long. We grew up in high school. Well, you are in another school, son of the prophet. You need cooperation and consensus in your circle. You need people who say, okay, we going to go cut. If I move, yeah, I ain't got to explain nothing to you. I, I'm trying to do something. Come on. How many of y'all need some friends that's just like, look, we, we about to build something. Okay, what we doing? Cooperation. A house divided against itself. I'm in the Bible. Whether it's uncomfortable or not, I'm in the scripture. A house divided against itself shall surely fall. You Christian and a Muslim, how that's gonna work? You baptize in the Holy Ghost and they don't believe in the fruit of the Spirit, how that's gonna work? You believe in cooperation, they believe in division. How does that? You believe in forgiveness, they hold grudges. How does this go? You want to be holy, they want to be ratchet. How does this go? I mean, that is a good mix, though. I, I might have been tripping a little bit. That, forgive me of that one. That, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that, you know. I think that's a good mix. <laughs> I think, my fault. That's good. That's what I want, you know. Chris, my bad. I, I get ahead of myself sometimes. I get in the spirit and I just say things. Because <laughs> both, most of us is both of them anyway. He was cutting down a tree. The axe head dislodged herself, fell in the water. Can I, can I just hurt your feelings, but really mean it in a good way? If you haven't ever almost lost your head, it's because you have never tried to make anything bigger. If, if, you, if you have never felt like you were about to completely lose your mind, it's because you ain't ever taken any risk. How many of y'all have ever felt like I'm about to go Come on, I, I, I really, 
don't have time to play with y'all. It's one Sunday left. We ain't no future in your front. And how many of you have ever felt like I'm about to go off? I'm, I'm about to lose my mind. I'm about to go off the handle. And the next person who says something to me, have you ever decided that the next person you get your hands on is going to pay for everything? That... How many of y'all, you just looking for a fight? What? 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 Come on, y'all. Don't be out. Be, you, yeah. What you say, God is able. Don't make me come. <laughs> sorry. What you mean you sorry? If you have never felt like you were going to lose your head, it's because you never used it. People of vision, when you get ready to attack something, when you make a decision that's unpopular, when you decide that you're going to go in a direction and let God fight the rest of it, when you decide, you know what, I have been on this job for 10 years, I've been on this job for 50, but it's time for me to do something else. I'm going to branch out and do something I've never done before. When you decide that you're going to finally go from renting to buying. And then you recognize that when you were renting, they were taking care of things that you never thought of. And now that you're buying, you got to think on another level. Sometimes it'll make you feel like Israel said, I just want to go back to the wilderness. Because new responsibilities make you want to retreat. Consensus. You need consensus. You need people in your circle. You need people in your squad. You need people on your team who have some of the same values and who are okay with some of the decisions and won't be jealous because you decided it was too small. But after the consensus came the confusion. Because you know you solve one problem. Mm -hmm. and then you solve, you solve one and then what happens? You, you, you cause another one, right? So you say, you know, they say the number one thing uh, that people are going to say on the first is, you know, number one goal is what? We're going to lose weight, right? But you ain't account for when you get in that gym and work out on the first day like you've been working out all year. How you going to feel in the morning? You're just going to go in there and you're just going to be determined to lose 12 pounds that day. <laughs> Slap your neighbor and say, ain't going to happen, Captain. This man panicked. He said... I lost my axe head. He said, I, I lost it. Now, watch this. He knows where it went in, but he doesn't know where it landed. Right. Right. Yeah. Some of you know it doesn't land where it goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I ain't got no help today. It was going to it, it, it doesn't land where it went in. Some of you, you, you remember the day you lost your mind. But from then on, it's a blur. You don't, you don't, you don't, you, you miss the next three weeks. You, you miss, come on. You don't know what, if somebody asks you what happened in, in the few months following that moment, you lost your head. You don't know because when you're submerged, you can't see. When, when your head is under the water, when your head is beneath the sand, when it is underneath the circumstance, you lose all of your sensibilities. He, 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 he doesn't know where it landed. And now I want to I wanna be philosophical here for a moment. I need you to pay attention. And now this is where the real problem begins. This is where the real problem begins. He knows where it went in. But now he's guessing about where it landed. God help me in this place. I want to give this to you because I want you to hear what I am saying. When it was in his hands, he knew exactly where it was. But when it went into the water, he moved from knowledge to perception. Now, 
The Bible says no weapon formed against us will what? In my estimation, one of the biggest weapons that the enemy has ever waged against mankind is perspective. Are you with me so far? I'm going to slow. I need you to hear me. It's, it's the biggest weapon. Why? Because we believe that whatever we perceive is actually knowledge. See, this is what happened in the Garden of Eden. They were operating in knowledge. God says, you can have anything, but don't eat of the tree that's forbidden. The enemy comes into the garden and take us, us from, takes us from knowledge to perspective. You can eat of it. You will not. And this is what has most of us defeated is because the enemy has hoodwinked us into having a higher value on our opinion than knowledge. You could read something in the Bible and say, I know what it says, but I don't know about all that. And this is why you have this whole fight against what scripture actually means. And now everybody's twisting scripture saying that it might be tampered with and how we know that a man didn't do it. You know why? Because they would rather be in perspective. Oh God. It's the big argument between Republicans and Democrats. One group says you should be able to do what you want with your body and the other one says that abortion is wrong and now you got two perspectives. And that's where the enemy has destroyed us is because we now trust perspective more than we do knowledge. We trust perception more than we do knowledge. And the Bible says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Not, and you shall have a perspective. Your perspective has encaged you. Lord, I knew you weren't going to say, see how you just shout, it's going to be big. Now I'm giving you meat and you sleep. I'm going to work you anyway. Touch your name and say, he's going to work it anyway. And from the moment the enemy brought perspective into the earth, nobody has been sure of anything since. You don't know who to trust. You don't know what decision to make. You don't know what job to take. You don't know what church to go to. You don't know what neighborhood to live in. You don't know what city to live in. You don't know what car you should buy. You don't know what neighborhood, you, you just, you're at, why? It's all about perspective. Am I going to live close to work or am I going to live close to church? Do I want to live close to the Galleria that I only can afford to go once a year? Or do I be smart and move out here somewhere where it's cheap and drive in when I got the money to go? Y'all ain't going to say amen, but say ouch. And since the intrusion of the ability to perceive, no one has been sure of anything. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Your instability in life right now and the reason why you cannot achieve your dream is because you're battling between what God said and what you think. If you ain't going to say man, just, just walk with me. Knowledge versus perspective. See, this is really a picture of the atonement because when Jesus came, and atonement, when you hear the word atonement, it's really like reparations. In other words, it's, it's, it's payment for sin. Okay, so Jesus is the atonement. He provided a payment for a sin debt that he did not accumulate. So this is atonement, watch this, because he takes us away from perception. This is what atonement does, perception, the law. It's like, it's like 700 and almost 800 laws, all of these perspectives. If, if, you, if, you, if you eat with this hand, that's a sin. And if you eat at this time, that's a sin. And if you do this, that's a sin. All of these perspectives. Then God says, I'm going to atone. I'm going to come and die for the perspective so I can get you back to knowledge, knowing me. God help me in this place today. I'm really trying to, I'm trying to encourage you and I'm trying to show you something that in the next year you're going to have to put lesser value on your opinion. 
and more of a value on what God said. Every time God gets ready to blow your mind, you allow your mind to blow it. Every time he gets ready to blow your mind, your mind gets to working and you blow it. Why? Because you go with your feelings and your opinion over what God said. That's good. I don't care if you say amen or not. But can I tell you something? His head went in the water. And, 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 and I know it because the text said it. The Bible says that Elijah said, man, this ain't nothing. Man, I done raised a dead boy. I, I called a barren woman to be pregnant. <laughs> man, cat over there at the, at the uh, local army, he, he, uh, he had leprosy. Man, I told him he took a bath and that came off. <laughs> See, if you start talking to your problems like they're not powerful, then you'll recognize that this thing that you're going through can be done just like that. <clears throat> and he says, all right, he says, all right, this is what we're going to do. He said, where, 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 you, where, where, you don't have to tell me where, where did it go in? Where did it go in? Oh, here is the next thing. Ah, confession. You, you, you got to admit that you lost your head. <clears throat> you got to admit that you lost your temper. You can't just be walking around here talking about they did. See, when, when it's always them, you'll never find your head. Come on, talk to me, somebody. <clears throat> he he could have said, it wasn't my fault. The person who made the axe, if they would have made it stronger, it would have never came up. He took, it, he took responsibility. He says, I lost it right here. Can you identify where you lost your head? Do you know where you were, who you were with? You know what you, 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 what you were wearing that day? Do you, do you remember what you were drinking the day you lost? And I'm just, I'm just giving you some circumstances. Do you remember what city you were in? What state you were in? What state of mind you were in? What company you were in? What circle you were in? Because if you don't know where you lost your head, then you don't know where to prevent yourself from going back to, from losing it. Again, he says it went in right here. I remember it. Just like it was today, and it was. It said it, it went in right here. I see another picture because look at what Elijah does. The Bible says Elijah goes and cuts down a stick, a branch, and throws it in the water. And the axe head. Now, ladies and gentlemen, of the jury, I want you to go home if you got an axe. And if you do, I'm kind of concerned about you. <laughs> Anybody got an axe? Let me see your hand. Yeah, I knew the two of you had one, but I'm kind of concerned about this area. I bet you your axe can't float in the water. It is impossible because of the aerodynamics of and the components of the axe head for it to float. He throws a stick in the Jordan River. This ain't just water. <laughs> if it was the Red Sea, I would have a problem. If it was the sea, if it was Euphrates, if it was Hidel, if it was uh, Gishon, if it was Pihon, if, if it was if it was the Nile River. I, but 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 the Jordan, because this is where Jesus. This is where his head went in the water. Remember, John the Baptist baptized Jesus and. His head went in the water. Now, wood in the scripture is a metaphor for flesh. <laughs> Y'all not listening, but I'm, I, ask, I ask you to pay attention to me now. So you've got a head that goes in water. You've got the same water where Naaman baptized himself seven times. You've got the same water where Jesus, his head went under this water and his body came up. And wood is a metaphor for flesh. So what he actually did is the head was sinking deep in sin. Far from, because you know when you sink, you kind of, it's sinking far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply staying within. Sinking. 
to rise no more. But the master of the sea, Elisha, cuts off flesh, throws it into the water, and now from the waters he lifted me. See, what is actually happening here, it is a picture of atonement where God is actually saying, I cannot make the choice for you, but I can give you a choice. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. Can I flip the script? All are called, but only those who choose to listen are chosen. And those who listen sooner are chosen faster. And so now the flesh has hit the water. And now the flesh has caused the axe head to rise because it's a picture of atonement. Flesh has now come to get the head. And now the axe head has without power, it has now, it's back in the hands of the man who cut it off, and now he has to reconnect it because God will never perform a miracle where your action is necessary. He didn't make the axe head jump onto it. He had to go get it and reattach it. See, God ain't going to save you without your confession. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised his son from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Somebody say, you got to confess it. Are y'all with me so far? So he throws the axe head, the, the stem into the water, the axe head floats, and it reattaches itself. Notice it only lost its connection when it was being used. Notice it only lost its connection when he was beating it against something that was resisting. The tree didn't want to fall and the axe head didn't want to give up. <laughs> and, and somebody was going to have to give in. Either the tree was going to have to fall or the axe head was going to have to go. It, but, but, but the tree said, I'm going to stand. And the tree stood powerful enough. See, the flesh is hard to deal with. That, that, that flesh stood up against that head and it did not fall and it was dislodged. And I bet you the tree thought it had won the victory. But it, it, it never knew that God has a grace for anybody who's lost their head. And I don't know who I'm talking to in here today, but I need you to just slap three people and say, God's got a grace for that. I don't care where your head went in. I don't care where you lost your confidence. I don't care where you lost your mind. I don't care where you lost your dream. If you can confess where it went in, God's going to make it come back up. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God's getting ready to make dead things resurrect in your life. He's about to bring things back to life that you thought were done. I don't want you to give up because you got to be not weary and well-doing. You will reap a harvest if you faint not. I decree and declare that things that you have given up on and that you had lost, God is about to bring them back to sight and he who has began a good work in you. Axe head begins to float. Can you see that? And you got to understand that an axe head falling in water is a curse because iron rusts in water. Is it possible that you have your head in things that are rusting you. Oh God, are you an environ, are, are you, and, and you don't have to be honest, but have you fallen into environments that are not good for your anatomy? You don't cuss till you get around them. You get around them, you just drink up everything. You don't. <laughs> come on, y'all. It's another year. Eh? Just, come on. When you're around your, your church friends, it's hallelujah, praise the Lord. I know that's right. God is good. You get around them, your words lose letters. You got some folk in your circle, you got to repent every time you leave them. You got to go home and say, Lord, I don't know why I do that when I get around them. Your head is in an environment 
that is not conducive to your survival. You got your head in circles. You should do you, you the circle you trying to get in is already too low. You trying to get accepted into a group that's already beneath you. And you're rusty. You don't even think fast enough anymore. You you don't recover fast anymore. You're just stuck. Angry all the time. Keep an attitude. Don't know how to forgive anymore. Stuck in how you think. Stuck in how you perceive. And if you get out of that environment and get around some people, oh God help me. You may have to give up a whole group for one individual. Stuck. And you lost your head. But I came to tell you, it's your job to keep it up. You got to lift your own, lift up your head, O ye gates. And be ye lifted up, ye everlasting, and the king of glory. So t- t- touch your neighbor and say, your head is your responsibility. You, you're going to have to get your head out of depression. You, you're going you're to have to stop crying about being rejected. You're going to have to stop crying about what they didn't do and what they didn't give and they didn't say sorry. Lift your head up. Slap somebody and say, get up! Oh, I feel glory in this room. Get up! Why is your head still in 1999? Come on, y'all. Why are you still crying on your husband's shoulder talking about your father was not there and you're 50? Oh, God, help me. See, you have given yourself an excuse to keep your head in the water because of what happened to you when you were a child. I wasn't raised like that. You done raised kids by now. We were raised to do so. Okay, that was 30 years ago. If I had some real people who were, who were serious about confession, you'd be, you'd be asking God to touch your, you right now because some of you have given yourself an excuse to keep your head into your past. That's how I was raised. That's how I grew up. That's where I came from. Okay. We know where it went in. Now can you identify where it went in so that God can lift it up? I came to tell you today that it is time to get your head out of the water and the water can be anything get your head out of the pain get your head out of the rejection get your head out of the frustration okay it happened touch somebody say it happened it happened but I am here to tell you right now God is about to undo that thing he is about to do the redemptive work he is about to do the atoning anybody in here want to thank him in advance because I see heads floating up I don't know who I just see heads popping up I see heads popping up all over the room I see people coming out of depression I see people coming out of situations that you never thought you were going to and that guess what when you come out your children are going to follow you I don't know who I'm talking to but some of y'all were just about to give up but I came to tell you don't cry dry your eyes keep your head his head started to float up can I tell you something and he had to can you see him having to step in the water And grabbing it himself, pulling it out of the water. He didn't say, I have no one. He didn't, he didn't ask, can you get that from me? If I, if I get married, maybe I'll get it. If I, if I get a job that pay me enough, then I'll be happy. If I get suitable transportation, then I won't be complaining anymore. If I could just get a check that'll pay me $3 more per hour, then I'll be. Nothing anyone can do for you or to you will get your head back. You can ask anybody in here who God gave a pay increase over this year, they still crazy. (laughs) 
he had to step in and get it himself. And he reapplied it to the stick. Watch this. He took custody of it. You got to stop outsourcing your head to other people. You got to go get it. Oh, God. You got to. Ain't nobody going to make you happy. You got to do it. Ain't nobody going to encourage you. You got to learn to. I need 50 people to shout. I'm going to do it this year. I'm going to praise till I get happy this year. I'm going to worship until I get a breakthrough this year. I'm going to fast and pray until God does it for me this year. Somebody say, you got to do it. You got to do it. And let me tell you, your neighbor can't praise God for you. You got to do it for yourself. And if you believe that praise is a weapon, I need you to open up your mouth over the next 30 seconds and begin to give God some praise. Come on, this next praise is going to release a miracle. This next praise is going to release what you've been praying for. Somebody shout, I came to get my head back. I came to get my money back. I came to get my confidence back. I came to get my swagger back. Let everything that has breath. I'm still waiting on you. I'm still waiting on you. I'm not about to do this one for you. This is your last Sunday. I dare about 200 people to give your neighbor a high five and shout, neighbor, I'm taking custody of my destiny. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I said. Turn and find you another neighbor and shout, neighbor, I'm taking custody of my destiny. I refuse to be depressed for another year. I refuse to be broke another year. I refuse to be downtrodden for another year. Slap your neighbor. Give him a high five and shout neighbor over the next 45 seconds. I'm about to bust a move because I believe that God's about to do a new thing. You can sit there if you want to. You can cry if you feel like it. But I'm about to lift up my head I look to the hill from which coming my help all oh, my help comes from the Lord lift up your head shout with a voice of triumph this is your year of release this is your year of a breakthrough this is your year of a comeback y'all still don't want to praise him I just need 55 people to step out in the aisle, step over your neighbor, and shout, neighbor, I've decided to leave my troubles behind. I've decided to wipe my own tears. I've decided to preach my own sermon. I've decided to anoint my own head. If I've got somebody who believes this is your year of a release, open up your mouth and shout yeah I feel a move of God I feel the spirit shifting in the atmosphere the devil should have killed you round about November but you messed around and made it to another year I believe this is the year of your release grab your neighbor by the hand and shout neighbor shout neighbor if you can't get out by yourself i'm gonna pull you until you release get out of that depression get out of that frustration forget what they think about you forget what they're saying get your head back get your head back because god's got something with your name on it shiny ass shiny ass Get 
your head back. Get your mind back. Get your idea back. Get your dream back. Slap three people say, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. I'm back, you gonna see, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Lift it up, lift it up, and I be lifted up from the earth. I'll draw when your head goes up. You can't draw with a bow down head. I'm broke, but my head's up. I'm sick, but my head's up. I'm lonely, but my head's up. Such a name, say lift it up, lift it up, lift it up. No more depression. No more frustration. You got to put on the garment of praise. For the spirit of heaviness shall yet. Lift it up. This is not arrogance, it's a sign. Lift it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you could manage to lift your head up and keep it there, God is going to blow your mind. But don't blow it with your mind. Your neighbor has survived something too. Stop getting so down on yourself like you're the only one who ever been through something. Look at your neighbor. They tell you that it ain't none of your business what they've been through, but they've been through something. Tell it. it I, uh, it's been real out here. But you survived. Even when you didn't think you were going to. That's the one thing about a story, it's so personal, you don't get a chance to tell it all, but on the other side, you can say, I made it over. That's what grandmama used to say, I made it over, I made it over, I made it over. Through many do dangers, toys and snares, I, I made it over, I made it over. You lift your head, I, you keep that head up all year. You hear me? All year. If you don't reach a goal, don't put your head down. If it doesn't happen in the time frame that you thought it was going to happen, keep your head up. God's about to blow your mind. It's about to blow your mind. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have brought us this far. And we thank you that you haven't brought us this far to leave us. As we leave this place today, oh God, allow us to make it back here Tuesday to see another opportunity to cross over into another season and another year. We're going to stop just splitting our lives up into the first of every year. You're good every day. And we're not going to wait to the first to thank you. We thank you right now in advance. 
as we leave this place allow us to walk into new seasons and expanded ter territory in jesus name we pray if you love the lord shout amen, amen. hug somebody on your way out tell them i love you i'll see you tuesday Don't give up on God because he won't give up.